Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts, of George Mason University and Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, find other episodes, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is October 29th, 2009, and my guest is Michael Heller of Columbia Law School and the author of The Gridlock Economy, How Too Much Ownership Wrecks Markets, Stops Innovation, and Costs Lives. Michael, welcome to Econ Talk. It's great to be here. So I want to start with a quote from the book. Uh, Early on, you say very provocatively, private ownership usually creates wealth, but too much ownership has the opposite effect. It creates gridlock. Gridlock is a free market paradox. When too many people own pieces of one thing, cooperation breaks down, wealth disappears, and everybody loses. So uh, ex- let's start by explaining what you meant by that quote. Well, good. Um, that The notion of gridlock, the notion of too many owners, is, 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 um, uh, is a riff in a, um, on a, on a more uh, familiar concept that many of us have of a tragedy of the commons. In a tragedy of the commons, uh, we have too few owners. Uh, and we end up often with overuse of a resource. So we have uh, too few owners on the ocean and people overfish it, or too few owners in the air, people pollute it. So the solution typically we have to a tragedy of the commons, the solution to the problem of too few owners, is we privatize. We create private property rights, and that is the great engine for conservation, a single decision maker who invests in the lake today so that there's more fish tomorrow. And what I discovered um, what this book discusses is the possibility that privatization can overshoot. Instead of too few owners in a tragedy of the commons, we can have too many owners in the tragedy of the anti-commons. Instead of a resource being uh, wasted in the economic sense uh, through overuse in a commons, a resource can be equally wasted uh, through underuse in an anti-commons. When you have too many owners, uh, you have the potential for them blocking each other from putting the resource uh, to any productive use. Let's start with the commons uh, and and use some of that intuition, which you uh, explore in the book as well, the the parallels and and, and contradictions between these two different examples. And it's it's lovely that we're taping this just a few weeks after Eleanor Ostrom uh, won the Nobel Prize in Economics, and and you talk about her work in the book. What are some of the ways that we that we that that societies and cultures deal with common property to avoid the tragedy. You mentioned privatization. It's not the only one, though, as you, well, right. as you point out. You know, historically, uh, the, um, when, when uh, people thought about uh, the commons, they often thought of uh, what's now called, more precisely, open access, the notion that absolutely anybody can use a resource, like the open ocean. And it's very hard to have uh, conservation, outcome, to have, um, conservation outcomes uh, in an open access regime. Um, so what privatization does is, is align the individual incentive with the resource, ultimately with a larger social welfare. If you uh, take too many fish out today, there's none left to reproduce for tomorrow. So one solution is privatization. Historically, there were two other basic kinds of solutions that have been noticed for tragedies of the commons. Uh, one is state control. Um, so uh, state socialism on the one hand, command and control, uh, uh, regulation over the environment is another. Um, and that's an approach, basically having the state tell you how much you can use. Uh, which has uh, been in, inappropriately in less and less favor as a solution to overuse. Privatization is often seen as the solution to overregulation uh, in a commons. What Lynn Ostrom um, uh, interjected into that debate, and what, what's really the basis for her Nobel Prize, is noticing um, the conditions under which commons property can succeed outside of state control on the one hand and privatization on the other. The, no, the, the circumstances in which groups are able to manage resources uh, effectively, even though they are commons as to each other, as to the insiders, and private as to the outsiders. So she noticed many of the mechanisms that seem to work, for example, having repeat play, having um, uh, relationships that go across that, the, the resource and other resources, having a small, small number of people, having, uh, you know, sharing the same church. The, she's identified the conditions in which commons resources uh, can perform economically um, at a very high level. And in those situations, uh, norms or uh, informal rules emerge through the cooperation of those players, and they're enforced not by the state, but by, as you say, repeat play or 
connections between people that, that would create affection and, and some form of altruistic uh, play between them. Well, altruistic on the one hand, but also wealth maximizing on the other. Correct. One of her great discoveries is that those sorts of norms can be the basis for wealth maximizing behavior, that you don't need to look on the one hand to the Leviathan, to the state, to command and control, or on the other hand to uh, complete atomization and individual privatization to the individual level. So there can be this intermediate solution between commons and private that can be wealth maximizing, as well as, well as very satisfying for the commoners who are part of this richly textured community. Yeah, I threw in that altruism because if if I personally benefit and impose costs on the rest of the group, if I care about the rest of the group, that tendency is going to be mitigated somewhat. That's right. Well, that's yeah. absolutely right. So what what what, what Ostrom what Lynn Ostrom showed is is basically helped us explore this whole range of sort of highlight the whole range of possibility um, in terms of altruism, in terms of wealth maximization between what has long been thought to be the entire spectrum of ownership, commons at one extreme, private at the other. And what she said was in the middle are some very interesting institutions. Um, what none of that historically, none of that debate has uh, what noticed was the possibility that from commons to private doesn't give you the entire spectrum of ownership. And what um, the anti-commons idea, what the gridlock economy book suggests, that there's an entire half of property relations and an awful lot of sort of the core economic problems of a modern high-tech economy that are on the other side of private property. That commons to private isn't the entire spectrum, it's only half the spectrum. And the other half uh, spans from private um, all the way to anti-commons ownership. So in the anti-commons, uh, explain how that would work and, and uh, what, give us some examples of it. Okay, well, see, the anti-commons is, uh, the, uh, the, the commons could not be a more familiar concept to your reader, to your, to your listeners. There, and if you go on Google, there are 100 million um, hits when you, when you put in the word commons. Um, this is a problem, the problem of overuse is one that we've been familiar with. Overuse has been a word in English for 400 years. The problem of underuse, the problem of resources being destroyed by being, by being wasted by not being deployed, is almost completely invisible. Um, uh, underuse only became a word in English in Scrabble, only three or four years ago. It wasn't, it, was a, it wasn't a legitimate Scrabble word until recently. Interesting uh, empirical test. The concept test. of underuse simply isn't part of our um, sort of core cognitive structure for how we think about resources. We have sort of a one-way ratchet when we think about it. But, but um, when you look across the modern economy, there are so many examples where the real economic problem is uh, multiple owners competing with each other in a way that leads to, leads to multiple vetoes and the resource being sort of left economically idle. So let me give you one example. Let me ask you a question. Um, think about what is the most underused natural resource in America? We can all sort of think about overuse. So what's the most underused natural resource? And the answer, um, it turns out, I think, is the airwaves. Over 90% of the airwaves in America are dead air. That is, they're not used at all. And that's in part an artifact of the way we've assigned property rights in broadcast spectrum. Um, we have thousands of owners with tiny geographically uh, located, non-transferable, limited-use uh, licenses that make it virtually impossible to assemble, for example, uh, national high-speed wireless networks, the kind of next-generation technology that an information economy is built on. And because we have so many fragmented owners, and it's so hard to put them together into a single resource, uh, the U.S. has fallen just in the last 20 years, number one, in information economy, telecom, wireless um, capacity, all out of the top 10, almost out of the top 20. Uh, when you come to America from much of the world, it's like stepping in back into a time capsule, going back in time to an era of missing wireless services, missing entertainment services that exist in much of the rest of the world. Tom Hazlitt, actually at, at George Mason, where you are, uh, has calculated that the cost of um, spectrum gridlock, what he calls the tragedy of the telecommons, a riff on this anti-commons idea, cost the U.S. economy trillions of dollars. That's one small example of gridlock, and it's not so small. Let me ask you two questions about that. Mm -hmm. First of all, the just to, to make it clear, you're talking when you're saying it's hard to take advantage of the potential of the system. It's because of what we would traditionally call transaction costs. It's just hard to negotiate with so many owners. Is that, that's, that's the issue, right? That's right. So one, one way to understand a tragedy of the anti-commons, like a tragedy of the commons, is that these are both different versions of transaction cost failures. Right? And it's difficult to negotiate with everyone, have everyone forbear 
from taking fish out in an ocean, and it's difficult to have everyone agree to sort of throw their piece of the puzzle in uh, in the anti-commons side. It, it's a little different, though, because in the anti-commons, in theory, I could – purchase all those rights, and then literally have control. In, in, in the open access story, that's much harder to do. It's, well, not, it, not really. I mean, you could have every... every you could pay uh, people not to... You could pay, everyone could agree to not, not to fish and, and each accept some payment for it. Yeah. I mean, in, in, at, at the very fundamental economic level, um, they are perfectly symmetric. Actually, James Buchanan and Yang Yun, also economists uh, uh, George Mason. At, at George yeah. Mason, um, uh, wrote a paper... Um, uh, a couple of years ago, proving mathematically this, the, this mathematical symmetry between commons and anti-commons. There okay, so, so carry on. The other clarifying question I had about, yeah. about wireless is, so my wireless life here, I don't travel a lot overseas, and my wireless life is it's pretty pleasant, but I'm not an intense user. If, when you say it feels like it's stepping back in time, what would you – I'm curious. What would a visitor from overseas notice that's missing? Is there anything tangible? Um, you could, there's a um, possibility for a lot more remote medical uh, work, um, a very uh, easy uh, uh, and powerful video conferencing you can't do here, a real-time uh, uh, multimedia uh, downloads, watching TV in real time on your cell phone, um, a lot of shopping and opportunities that you uh, were, were uh, beaming, um, uh, advertising from stores that you're passing right to your phone, coupons that you can use right there. There's lots of, of both um, um, commercial, uh, medical, um, and communications technologies that exist that rely on very high capacity, high broadband, speed, yeah, and, okay. that we, and that we just don't have. I mean, yes. for example, you know, the, the the Nextel network was a bunch of old pizza delivery licenses that Nextel was um, able to slowly assemble, but it's not very good spectrum for those kinds of uh, very high capacity next generation uses. That's one very small example. It's hard to it's hard to know that you're missing something if you're just existing in an American framework of this is what we have. Mm-hmm. It's only when you look overseas you see, you see the gap between what we, what we have here and what's technologically feasible. So in that case, and I, I think I've talked to Tom about we did I did a podcast with Tom on this, and I think we talked about it, but you can refresh my memory better. Uh, w- what's the policy solution that would unlock those resources and get rid of the gridlock in that, in that particular case? Well, one of the, the the first step always is to notice that there is growth, that to, is to notice that there is this economic loss from a misspecification of property rights. That it turns out that how we define property rights is much more powerful than people realize, and um, it's often invisible on this anti-commons or gridlock side. We don't know to be upset with the allocation of spectrum licenses because we don't know what it is that we're missing until someone like Tom comes in and says, "Hey, you know, this is an example of gridlock." And the cost can be measured, and we can measure it by comparison with the leading edge of technology, which the U.S. was on and, it, and we're no longer on now. So the response is that becomes a very powerful message when you think about um, FCC policy, federal communications policy, what they should be doing about next generation uh, wireless. So what can they do in terms of assigning those the pieces well, of the spectrum? Well, it can be you can you can ha- you can make it um, in, in, in all the gridlock stories that we'll t- we'll talk about today. Um, the challenge is always. How do you assemble resources in a simple, low transaction cost way in a world with a really valuable use uh, requires assembly? Um, and uh, for, for licenses, a part of that is making um, licenses more, uh, more uh, uses, um, um, uh, a wider array of uses on the one hand, and easier transferability on the other, making telecom licenses look like, operate more like ordinary private property. Yeah, that, that's clearly a. Uh, it's not as to me as compelling a story as some of your others because there it's not so much the fragmentation and the number of owners as it is the non-transferability and the restrictions on use. Although obviously, once you've gotten rid of those, it still might be a, a challenge given that you've handed them out in the way you have. Let, let's move on to the story that I find more more interesting and and more compelling, which is the and we've talked about that here as well. Talk about the the use of patents. And the challenge is, first, let's do medicine first, then let's move on to music and other forms. Well, this really is a, is, is a very, uh, I, I also find a very compelling example and another hidden example of gridlock. Uh, more and more today, what we're finding is that um, a lot of cutting-edge uh, treatments, for example, gene therapy, uh, requires intervention across a whole range, of, um, in, in a gene, gene therapy context, across a whole range of genes, and each of those genes is separately patented. Or if you want to have a diagnostic tool, say for cancer, uh, 
uh, you need to have access to lots of genes and gene variations, again, all separately patented. Imagine uh, walking into an auditorium, and it's filled with um, the owners of uh, all the relevant patents to one gene therapy treatment or one diagnostic tool. Each of those patents is separately owned, and unless you can assemble, get agreement from every single patent owner in the room, uh, the tool or the therapy doesn't work. And each of those patent owners is usually some small biotech startup, uh, and each of those has raised financing on and is very committed to the value of their individual patent. And they each demand the corresponding price, a price that has in mind the potential profits that you might make from the therapy as a whole. Um, what that it's a means version is, of a version of the holdup, what used to be called the holdup problem. Yeah, this is another absolutely. This is a version of holdup problem, or in in basic economics, the notion of uh, complementary inputs. You have a series of complementary inputs. You need all of them. You need all of the sections of train track to get from here to there. Uh, and if you miss any one of them, uh, you you don't get from here to there. It's not uh, like you get three quarters of it. You get nothing. You get nothing. So in that in in that world, uh, separate ownership. Is actually uh, is actually suboptimal. The 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 uh, the, um, the wealth maximizing approach when you have complementary inputs, lots of pieces of track to, from here to there, or lots of patents that you where you need all of them for a single treatment is monopoly ownership. You want them all combined in a uh, in a single uh, in a single owner. And what's happened in the in the drug context is that as um, drug development has moved from a single patent, reading on a single molecule, a single drug. That's the old style. The new style of bioinformatics and um, gene therapies that require lots of different separately patented inputs, um, innovation has is, progress, is increasingly breaking down. In, in the United States in the last 30 years, we've had uh, 40,000 um, DNA patents roughly granted. We've had a steady increase up and up and up year over year in drug R&D investment. So the amount of money going into the pipeline and research has been going steadily up. The number of drugs that actually treat disease has been steadily going down. We have what I call a drug discovery gap, and that drug discovery gap is due to you know a lot of different problems, FDA approval process, and so on. But an important part of that puzzle is um, is pat- what I call patent gridlock. We have drugs that uh, could exist, that should exist, that aren't being created. We cre- we grant patents. The reason we have the patent system is to promote innovation. Paradoxically, more patents, too many patents, can mean fewer life-saving innovations. We give the example, uh, why don't you talk about it, of, of golden rice, which I thought was a really nice story of the tension between uh, over potentially under-patenting and over-patenting. So t- tell about what happened there. It's fascinating. Here's another, this is another story in this universe of uh, too many rights leading to too little um, social uh, uh, value. Um, the, it is increasingly the case that if you want to have some next generation, some high-tech uh, innovation in the world of plants, uh, it used to be the case <coughs> that you hybridized uh, traits that you wanted into your plants and you produced, uh, um, uh, that produced the Green Revolution, which is fed, feeds a lot of the world. Um, and the inputs to hybridizing plants used to all be in the public domain, just like the inputs to drug discovery used to all be in the public domain. Um, more and more, those inputs are now being separately patented. So um, it becomes uh, impossible. The freedom to operate, to create some new product, some, some new plant product, uh, becomes more and more hedged in by uh, patents that you confront as you begin to try to breed in the traits that you care about. So the golden rice is a, is a really sad example uh, um, in the following sense. Um, uh, some scientists, uh, Ingo Petroikas and Peter Boyer, uh, realized that one simple solution to the problem of a uh, uh, major problem of child blindness around the world and child mortality is uh, stems from vitamin A deficiency. People don't get enough vitamin A, and a simple way to solve that would be to have uh, the vitamin A uh, produced by the ordinary rice that that poor folks ate uh, as their primary diet around the world. And they figured out a way to have ordinary rice uh, uh, um, produce a sufficient amount of vitamin A to basically save millions of lives and prevent millions of cases of blindness. Um, but in the process of engineering vitamin A rice, what they call golden rice, they discovered that that, that, that new type of rice infringed on roughly 70 uh, U.S. patents. Bringing that, so they discovered the rice, they created the rice, the rice is ready to go, it could save millions of lives, and they couldn't bring it to market. 
because um, to bring it to market, they would have had to negotiate uh, these uh, dozens and dozens of separate patents. Now, in that particular context, the golden rice context, um, they already had this valuable product in hand, valuable in terms of life-saving, although not monetarily very valuable, and they were able to shame the patent owners to uh, basically create a humanitarian uh, license for this one particular product. So for golden rice, for the moment, uh, the product is potentially coming to, coming to market. Uh, but all of the other examples, all of the similar examples of bioengineered foods that could be very life-saving but are also hedged in by, um, by too many fragmented patents, uh, those are the ones we don't even hear about. Yeah, I was struck, though, by the... Um... I forget which one of the founders had this realization or whether it's accurate or not. I guess an open question. But he, he talked about his anger that these property rights were preventing him from getting the product to market and then realized – and I don't know if this is true. It's an interesting question – that that those property rights had created the incentive for the techniques to be created that allowed him ultimately to create his product. And so there was a tension there, and I think that's – I mean, I think the fundamental policy question, and why don't you talk about it, is, you know, sometimes you have, you have a huge array of different examples in the book. Some of them are, are just historical accidents. Some of them are the results of policy decisions made in the past or personal, private decisions where it was hard to anticipate the complexity that would come down the road. But in this particular case, I mean, is it a mistake to allow people to patent so, a, a particular technique or a particular hybridization or a t particular gene, and are we getting – is the suggestion that we have too much or – and should we, we should have less? Should we have zero? What would be the – some of the policy implications of, of the less cheerful outcomes that you find other than golden rice where products that are potentially life-saving are very, very expensive to bring to market because of the cost of assembling the property rights? All right. This is the. Uh, I think if if, I were, if if we were to characterize the contribution of this gridlock notion, it isn't to say there shouldn't be patents. That's not my view at all. My view is to expand the debate to include the possibility of uh, the hidden costs from the way that we structure property rights. Um, let me say that a little bit simpler way. Patents are a good thing, right? If it weren't for biotech patents, there wouldn't be the biotech revolution. Uh, the massive inflow of uh, money into biotech research ar arises uh, because it's possible to get production. Um, so in general, uh, I'm very pro-patent. Uh, but what, we, what, what the gridlock insight suggests is in that, against that general backdrop of patents being mostly a good thing, we need to think about, um, uh, as, a pol as policymakers, uh, what are the potential costs? That um, privatization isn't the end point, it's an optimum between overuse and underuse, between commons and anti-commons, um, that what we're aiming for is not the m most amount of property rights. What we're aiming for is the best design property rights. And there are a lot of implications for that insight for uh, patent law. So just this past weekend, uh, um, there was a conference on the gridlock economy uh, at Georgetown Law School, co-sponsored with uh, Stanford Law School. You can probably, your, your viewers can probably... Uh, find um, the um, podcast from that um, online. We'll put a link up to it. Put a link up. Um, and uh, that was the that was the question for the entire conference: was uh, what are the implications for patent law from it... the gridlock from the gridlock insight? Um, and it's particularly salient uh, for areas of the economy like semiconductors and telecom, banking, uh, internet uh, shopping. Um, uh, any of these technologies that, that require software that require the assembly of thousands of patents, uh, your cell phone, uh, uh, the several thousand patents right on any particular cell phone. There's no way to do online banking without uh, infringe or without uh, um, um, dealing with potentially 10,000 patents. And it is given the way our patent system works, it is both impossible to discover the patents that you need uh, and impossible. To, to um, uh, if you could discover all of them, to know whether or not the claims cover your product or not. You simply cannot design a high-tech product that isn't uh, infringing dozens or hundreds of patents. That such a product doesn't exist. And what that means is that the products that are most successful are then uh, subject to, hold up by uh, patent owners who can claim willful infringement, even if you didn't even know that their patent existed. 
And anticipating that legal cost, a lot of people you suggest are hesitant or uninterested in innovation as a result. Well, that's the real see. That's the real tragedy of of, of gridlock or the anti commons. Tragedies of the commons are typically very visible. You can see that the air is polluted. Tragedy of in the ocean, you can see that there's you know, you're not catching the same number of fish or lobsters. Tragedies of the anti commons tend to be invisible. It's the drugs that aren't invented because scientists shy away from doing research in areas where they don't control the underlying property rights. It's the cell phones that don't come to market because the, um, uh, the you know, Verizons and AT&T and com- uh, AT&Ts of the world uh, uh, know that uh, they simply can't uh, um, acquire the underlying property rights that they need. So it's an invisible, it's often an invisible tragedy, things that don't get done, innovations that don't get made. That's very interesting. I mean, we've had uh, McKelly Boldreen on here who, who, talk, who talks very... Uh, provocatively about getting rid of patents in most areas. Um, it's going to be a very interesting question in the coming years as both the legal scholars and economists try to figure out whether uh, we should be treating intellectual property differently than we have been in the past. Do you have any thoughts on where we're going? Well, where we're going is it's hard to know. Where we should be going is to be asking these kinds of questions, the kinds of questions that paying attention to the gridlock features of patents makes more Salient. That was really the upshot of this, of a number of conferences on um, that we've now had uh, on this book, uh, and it's it's consistent with the Belgian book, and it's also consistent with a book by uh, uh, Mike Moyer and uh, Jim Beston. I don't know if you've had them on the show. No, I don't know them. Um, they have a book uh, called uh, Patent Failure, where they've tried as best they can uh, as economists to measure the overall effect of uh, patents on um, economic uh, gr- uh, growth, and their findings are are pretty startling, which is that. Uh, leaving aside pharmaceutical and chemicals, leaving aside which uh, Boldrin also and Levine also do by right, the leaving way, leaving aside that one area where patents are uh, seem to be wealth producing. Outside of that area, uh, the net is that patents are wealth destroying. They suppress innovation; they don't create it. That um, if you and if you talk to um, the Intel's and the Cisco's and the uh, the Googles of the world, they would rather live in a world where their uh, intellectual um, uh, uh, property is that she is protected not through property rights, not through patents, not through, uh, uh, but through trade secrets, through process protection, through being first mover, through but uh, but patents uh, they find are destructive rather than constructive, on on balance overall uh, for innovation. Well, that's encouraging to me if it's true, right? Because the patent environment, the intellectual property environment, is itself a sort of commons, mm-hmm. and if all the players think that we're degrading it through um, these, what in, in in the extreme is called a government monopoly, at the other extreme is just called private property, depending on your perspective. Uh, then I think we'll probably move toward a different environment down the road. Well, that's that that may. It, it, it's not necessarily what true. happens. Then is you move is, is you move from the world of economy to political economy, and it's been <laughs> point. It, it's been very difficult. That the gridlock argument in the patent area. Uh, has a lot of, I think, has a lot of power. It has more and more salience uh, when you talk to, um, you know, talk to the staffers on the Hill. You talk to lobbyists working in, uh, working in the issue. This is one of the most heavily lobbied um, um, issues uh, um, on the Hill. How do we get patent reform? And there's been a bipartisan bill floating around on the Hill for the last um, uh, four years now, really aimed specifically at um, uh, ending patent gridlock. Making it easier to assemble uh, to assemble patents when it's economically useful to do so, uh, co-sponsored by um, uh, Leahy and um, and Hatch, uh, and the bill keeps not quite uh, getting anywhere in part because uh, Congress isn't going to go forward until the two big opposing sides come to some sort of bipartisan agreement. And the bipartisan there isn't Democrat and Republican. The bipartisan there is pharmaceuticals and um, and IT. So. Yeah. The, well, what's interesting, I mean, it's true of any any of these common solutions that there's often an existing set of owners, either implicit or explicit, who are going to – you've got to find a way to make – to compensate them, to get them to at least – if you want their – if you need their support for a transition, you're going to have to get their uh, – make them at least as well off as they are now, and that's sometimes hard to do. That's right, and the status quo, and the status quo in, um, in, in the patent world is the current basic patent law, which is, uh, was designed in 19 19- – was written in 1952, before we discovered DNA, before the internet. Uh, at a time, it was the, the 1952 Act was written then to support a style of industrial innovation, 
where there was a much closer link between a single patent and a single product. That style of innovation isn't the way America innovates anymore. Patent law is only about uh, giving the minimum amount of protection necessary to get the maximum or socially optimal amount of innovation. We have a, we have a compromise that was reached 50 years ago for a style of innovation that no longer is, that no longer is where wealth generation is at today. Wealth generation today is largely about assembling hundreds, thousands, or tens of thousands of patents in a single product, um, but a patent law that is absolutely uh, not uh, uh, tuned to that style of innovation. Uh, but on the Hill, um, uh, the status quo prevails unless you can break the gridlock. Yeah. But breaking the gridlock requires uh, a massive supermajority, which is very hard to put together. It's the political equivalent of the economic gridlock that I yeah. talk about in the book. Yeah, for sure. Uh, talk about uh, – let's move on to music and uh, documentaries. You have some really interesting observations. In particular, the, I, I, I found – one of the many things I found interesting about the book was the um, – this – mashup or bundling or the change in the nature of innovation. So talk about it in the cases of music and, and film. Well, in the world, just to make the segue there, in the world of patent, we've moved from a world of one patent, one product. In the world of um, artistic expression, whether it's music or film um, uh, or television, uh, what we have today is much more is less, it's much more is um, trying to, people trying to put together bits, separately owned bits of copyrighted culture. So for me, one very powerful example is, um, uh, um, is, a, is a film documentary called Eyes on the Prize. Uh, that was put together um, uh, 20 years ago by a guy named Henry Hampton, a filmmaker. It was a documentary about Dr. Martin Luther King. And to make this documentary film, Hampton uh, pulled video clips from AD archives. Um, he had 300 photos that he pulled from another 100 archives. He used about 120 songs. When he broadcast Eyes on the Prize, um, it won an Emmy in 87, and then it disappeared. The film went into a vault. It couldn't be burned onto DVD. It couldn't be shown again on TV um, because uh, he didn't control, Hampton didn't control all of those hundreds of separate small pieces of rights that he needed, of copyright that he needed uh, for DVD licensing or rebroadcast. So what that meant was the most important film account of the American Civil Rights Movement uh, basically couldn't be seen. Um, you couldn't uh, identify who the rights owners were. It's very hard. There's no central registry of copyright owners. Uh, and then uh, even if you can identify the people, bargaining with them is extremely difficult. And if you can't assemble the licenses. So today, this problem of what's called clearing rights in the copyright world uh, is what one person calls this um, half Sherlock Holmes, uh, half uh, Monty Hall. And there are tens of thousands of examples of the cutting edge of creative expression of products that don't come to market. Uh, because assembling little tiny bits of copyrighted culture, even a couple seconds or even a second, uh, is uh, extremely costly. The very uh, nature of rap music in this country has changed uh, because of this underlying problem of economic gridlock. Uh, if, if, you're a, if you're a fan of old, um, old hip-hop, you know, like uh, Chuck D, Public Enemy, uh, he used to rap over um, uh, uh, basically what he called the collage of sound. Um, hundreds of tiny samples that he collaged together and then over which he would rap. Um, typically today, rappers don't do that. They have a single sample. And the reason they have a single sample is that they can license one sample fairly easily, but licensing 300 is, is virtually impossible. So it wasn't that taste changed in hip-hop music. It's that the legal environment made, uh, the, the gridlock environment, made a whole style of artistic expression of, uh, illegal. Um, I, I think that's a, a terrible loss for hip-hop, um, but, you know, people, there's reasonable debate over that. But what, however you come out on hip-hop, it's also true for documentary filmmaking, for television, uh, for film in general, and for music in general. Let me ask you two questions about that. First, uh, as you point out in the book, uh, you would think there would be a potential for a fair use exemption on some of these cases, and yet publishers, music companies, uh, they're very um, uneasy about testing that limit, it seems to me. Just in my own personal case, um, in my last book, I wanted to use a quote. It was about 35 words uh, from a movie at the front of my last book, The Price of Everything. And I just thought it would be just fine to put it in the book. And yet my publisher felt we had to get permission. That did involve a set of bizarre negotiations with multiple sources <laughs> to get the right to use 35 words. Um, I found it interesting. Of course, if it were me, 
if I were publishing the book, I'd have just published it and taken my chances. My publisher, Princeton University Press, obviously has a different stake in the legal consequences. It's just interesting that there isn't more uh, fair use exemption uh, as a way to solve that problem. Well, what is a fair use exemption at any – well, let me just back up for your listeners. Um, uh, the copyright uh, – in, in American <laughs> law, copyright is never an absolute right. The, the original bargain that the law made with, with authors is um, we want to give you some protection for your expression, copyright, uh, in, order to, um, in order to promote – you know, to give people a reason to, to go to the effort of writing books or making songs. We don't want to give you too much, and we don't want to give you protection in cases uh, where giving you that protection is going to, in turn, reduce speech or, in turn, block negotiations. So for small snippets, for parody, for, we have a, for educational use, we have a series of exemptions we, where, where the user um, doesn't have to get permission of somebody else's copyrighted work. And that, uh, that uh, exemption, that exception, is a fair use exception. And that's built into the original uh, uh, deal that the U.S. has made with, with authors back to the 1700s. So the contours of that exception, the various exception, are uh, potentially one of the one of sort of the previously unnoticed uh, virtues of the fair use exception is that it becomes a place where you can solve gridlock. So the wider that exception is, the easier it is to assemble small fragments under one new umbrella to put together a collage of small snippets of music samples into some new into some new creative work. Um, so for you as an author, you, what you ran into was, I think, the, um, I think that uh, university presses, like you mentioned, Princeton Press, and universities in general, are often on the wrong side of this debate. Uh, they come out typically in favor of strong copyright uh, and uh, limited fair use. And I think as educational institutions, as university presses, uh, that's actually the wrong side for them to be on. Usually, um, professors uh, want the widest dissemination of their work. Uh, and we usually are willing to give it away for free. The, the, the payment to faculty is more in terms of prestige and reputation rather right. than cash. Yep. Um, so uh, to the extent that you know, the, the problem, though, is that fair use policies aren't decided by, by, uh, by us as faculty, or even us as law faculty. Um, they're decided by university's general counsel office, uh, and they aren't really attuned to the needs of the faculty. They're, looking, they're thinking about the university itself as a property rights owner. Yeah, well, I think they're worried about the potential costs of being sued. Uh, and I think that's, I think that uh, one of the points about fair use is that it isn't written in stone. What fair use doctrine is at any point is the, is what's reasonable, uh, is, is also reasonable use. And what's reasonable is what people are actually doing. So the extent that, um, so what uh, music publishers, in your case, a film publisher, um, what they're doing is sort of, it's like in baseball, they're trying to brush you back from the plate. And the, the more they brush you back, and that's okay, and that's ruled a strike, uh, the, you know, that changes the strike zone. So um, the, only way that, um, the only way that we get to use uh, uh, snippets, your 35 words, or uh, educational use, is if, we, is if we assert it. I think that, um, I think that faculty should be, should be more aggressive about asserting educational use. Yeah, well, I, I asserted it. I think it's a good idea, um, it, mainly because you know, for 35 words, I thought, that the pe- person who wrote those 35 words, is this really your point, uh, wanted, wouldn't mind seeing them in my book. Um, the owner of the film rights, I don't think it would hurt th- that the movie, I quote from the movie K-Pax with Kevin Spacey, I would think the studio would like it. It would all be good. There's not, I'm not really in hurting their sales at all. But in fact, I'm enhancing them by a tiny, tiny amount. But there's sort of two punchlines to the story, and I want to bring it back to the Eye on the Prize, which we didn't finish. One punchline is, I got the rights. They were easy once I got the right person to talk to, which wasn't so easy. But I got the rights. They were relatively cheap because I thought, oh, you know, it's just an academic book. It's not a big deal. The Eye on the Prize story did take a long time, but he did get it into – he did get the rights for most of the stuff. And I think part of the reason in both of those cases that it happened is that it had a little bit of the flavor of your Golden Rice story, very little in my case, but more in the Eye on the Prize, which is – you can kind of shame and 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 cajole people when the cause is really a, a, a compassionate, desirable, and and uh, noble one. When it's just making a lot of money, it's a lot harder to get people to give in. Right, but from a social welfare standpoint, uh, we we want to encourage, we want to design a property rights system that that does generate the creation of a lot of uh, money, a lot of wealth. And, totally agree. And the, <laughs> the the big the big cost 
to um, misdesign property rights, to misspecified fair use or overly broad damages in the patent context or overly narrow licenses in telecom is that we actually destroy a lot of wealth uh, that's easily available to us by designing the rights in a somewhat smarter way. I also, in, in the Gridlock book, for those of your readers who, who, um, who pick it up, you'll see that I have, um, it, it's really a book written for, um, uh, written for you know, people who don't care about economics or who don't care about, um, who doesn't require... A, it's not you know, technical. Fancy, I think it is... Technical. It's a very yeah. easy, and, and, the, story, and the, the book from start to finish is stories like what happens with rap music. And I illustrate them all uh, with uh, pictures and graphs, uh, but mostly you know just just photos that I that I um, had I had to license each of those for yeah. the book, and yeah. I spent I spent uh, I, I lived the I lived the same kind of gridlock that you did in putting the book together. A little bit harder. I, for example, yeah. have a, um, a the, I have a deed to a square inch of land in Alaska. Yeah, I saw that, that. was a uh, a great marketing triumph by Quaker Oat Cereal when they they put these deeds in in cereal boxes in the late uh, in the late fifties and um, and. Tens of millions of these square inch deeds went, you know, flew off the shelves. It was the, the biggest marketing success in, in, in advertising history, just about. Um, and I, I used that that example, the example of a you know square inch ownership of land, to ask the question, you know, what if you need, needed to then assemble the land to some larger purpose? But just to sh- to use that picture uh, in the book, which is a, it's a cool it's a cool picture, and um, uh, took uh, a weeks of negotiation. I had to uh, track down, uh, you know, Quaker Oats is now part of PepsiCo. PepsiCo. Uh, has a ended up dealing with their chief IP lawyer, and uh, they they and, and I couldn't figure out if they owned the rights to this deed, and we ended up working out a quick claim agreement uh, where uh, they let me use it if they own the rights. They weren't sure, <laughs> um, but each uh, I had uh, there were dozens of negotiations, yeah. and the point there is that part of why university books are so bo- uh, look so boring, you know, part of why university um, press books uh, by and large are so so text heavy and uh, yeah, sort of interesting feature light is that um, most people don't have the patience and curiosity and legal, you know, training to do all these negotiations um, that it took to get them into, you know, it, from an economic standpoint, it was the amount of time I spent negotiating licenses to get cool pictures in the book was uh, was ridiculous. Um, well, l- let me raise one aspect. Of this this is my other question. Which is one of the costs of this isn't just the back and forth of the negotiation because sometimes that's not so bad. They say this is our price. You can you can actually sometimes say, well, it's a nonprofit or I'm just a single guy. I'm not going. It's not. A, it may not be a, uh, um, a, a for profit venture. You're not going to charge for it. For example, uh, those of you longtime listeners uh, who who are used to the opening of Econ Talk, the music. Uh, the creator of that, whose name escapes me right now, but it's on our website, gave us the right to use that music because we liked it. We thought it was cool, and he said, fine. My first choice was actually the opening chord, the opening bars of um, If I Had a Million Dollars by the Bare Naked Ladies. And we had a great deal of trouble trying to get the publisher of that music. And it's complicated because there's lyrics and music, there's national, there's international rights. Getting them to agree, and they they wanted a very high price, which was, I thought, strange because we don't make any money off this site. It's for educational purposes, but that negotiation was just uh, they had a fixed price, and that was that. I like the idea. I like to think that if the uh, composers, the actual the bare naked ladies themselves, or the men of the bare naked ladies, if they uh, could hear Econ talk, they'd be proud to give it to us. But Putting that to the side, they don't control uh, the rights. I mean, they, part, part right, the that's message, the other complexity. That's part true. Part of the message of the gridlock book is, and I, I, I recently um, gave um, a keynote at, speech at the World Copyright Summit. That was the 500 CEOs from around the world who control the ASCAPs and BMIs, all of the collective copyright um, rights management uh, agencies around the world that actually license all of these different rights to different kinds of new and interesting uses of music or film or, 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 or literature. And what, what I heard back from them, which, which was surprising to me, but uh, in, in retrospect it makes a lot of sense, is that for them, you know, piracy is, is, is a big concern, right? So what they said was um, the biggest concern for them, and actually what drives a lot of the piracy, the biggest concern for them as collective rights agencies, people trying to monetize creative expression, the biggest concern is not piracy anymore. The biggest concern is, is, is actually gridlock, um, that it is so difficult to assemble the rights 
that people need for reasonable, economically sensible, uh, wealth-maximizing uses, that uh, people end up uh, being either either not using them, sort of foregoing them altogether, or being pirates. That the 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 piracy itself is an artifact of the difficulty of having uh, of, of sort of breaking through gridlock in the copyright area. So just as we lose drugs and uh, you know people lose their lives in the patent area, uh, we also lose a lot of creative a lot of value from creative expression in the copyright area because these agents these corporate rights agencies themselves find it so hard to manage the fragmented rights uh, that we that exist in copyright. So the other question I was going to ask is uh, you mentioned in passing that when you're talking about the challenge of assembling the book that you know there's no central registry. Wouldn't that help? I know it's not the whole problem. It's maybe not even a big part of it, but it's not even a huge part of it, but it's a big part of it. It's interesting to me that there is no central clearing house registry or anything like it. Uh, and would that be an enterprise worth pushing? Well, you know, like if, as a good economist, your, your, your question is always, you know, what's the cost of establishing the registry versus what are the, um, you know, what are the costs and who bears them versus, versus the benefits? So for, uh, we have a registry for, um, for land, right? There is, um, that you, you, can, you can pretty much uh, figure out uh, who controls and who has rights and up to a point in the American system. Uh, in land, uh, you can more or less figure that out for um, cars, right? You have a central, you know, have a DMV that registers cars, you have license plates. Um, so for some some products, we we have registries uh, where the value to society of having it for establishing liability and so on is very high, um, uh, and the cost is relatively low. Uh, for copyright, um, you have an enormous number of works and an enormous number of rights in them, uh, which fragment quickly over time as the original creator dies. Um, or in the music context, uh, the difference between the, the person who writes the lyrics, the person who performs it, there's um, different kinds of uses, all of different kinds of rights. It's, the rights are both enormous numbers of them and enormously fragmented, so it's hard. To, uh, the, establishing a registry would be complicated. The, a lot of the, um, I don't know if you've had a speaker on the Google Books settlement, um, but Google Books is trying to address uh, uh, this problem of fragmented ownership um, uh, in in written text um, by scanning all the world's books and putting them online and having uh, creating basically a central pile of money uh, that um, that w- uh, where, where when you, people use these books so the money would get paid into the central registry and then the registry would then be tasked with trying to track down uh, who the owners are of the various pieces. So a lot of trying to jumpstart the process of creating that kind of registry for books. Yeah, I want want to come back to that in a second, but just to clarify what Google's doing right now, they have, I assume, um, digitized many, many, uh, as have other people, obviously, many, many works that are in the public domain. Those are there's lots and lots of of. Uh, digitized versions of Treasure Island or Shakespeare or all kinds of things. And, and there's no controversy over that. There's no one needs to get paid over works from before 1923. Right. It's the after that because of uh, of copyright. Right. And there's books that are in copyright and in print that publishers are now actually have on the market. And those also aren't part of the, what Google is doing. So books that are in public domain, there's no controversy. You can use them. Books that are in print, and in copyright, there's no controversy. The publishers control them. You can go to you can get you can negotiate for that. Go to the bookstore, but there's roughly 20 million books under American copyright that are under copyright, but aren't in print. You can't go to the bookstore and buy them. You can't go to the publisher and buy them. And as to those books, basically the, the bulk of knowledge that's been produced in book form in the 20th century, uh, they basically, unless you happen to be near a library that happens to have a copy, uh, you have no way of accessing it, and there's no way to search it um, easily. So what Google has done is for those 20 million books, they've put those books, they've digitized those, and they're trying to make them available to people uh, uh, at the word level. You can search, you can search uh, within the books by word, and if you find a book that you're interested in, uh, you can uh, download a copy, but you, but you buy the book. You pay a fee for it, and that fee then goes to a central registry. That's what Google is doing now? Yeah. How are they doing that, given that they don't own the rights to the book? Well, and, and therein lies the uh, controversy that's been in the, in the press over the last two years over the um, suit between the Society of Auth- the Authors Guild saying you can't do this on behalf of authors and Google saying our, um, 
that we are, but we'll, what we're doing is fair use. That is, we're not uh, we're not making the whole book available to people. We're just making a snippet available when they search. If they want to get the whole book, they have to buy. They basically have to go buy a copy of it. And of course, their argument is that since they're out of print, the authors, the holders of the copyright, assuming they're alive or their heirs have rights to them, they're not making any money off them anyway. So if I've written a book that's Let's say there's 10,000 copies of my book scattered around the, the libraries of America, and they're right. presumably on somebody's shelves, right. and somebody else wants one, they can't have it. Right. Uh, and this at least gets you, gives you the opportunity to, to quote it, uh, presumably, and, and potentially – And to discover it. And to discover it, which would be good too. So again, I, I, it hasn't been settled, right? It has, well, what happened is, is uh, the, the, there's a comprehensive settlement um, – that's been negotiated between Google and uh, the Authors Guild um, and major publishers. Uh, the settlement attracted a tremendous amount of opposition over the past few months uh, by authors who didn't feel their interests were represented, uh, by foreign countries who felt that their nationals' works weren't uh, adequately taken care of by an American settlement, um, and then most recently by the Justice Department, which weighed in on sort of complicated antitrust grounds. So the settlement is now pending in a in a district court, and um, uh, Google and the Authors Guild are going back to renegotiate around the concerns of the several hundred um, stakeholders who uh, objected to the first draft settlement. But all that's happening here is um, is people trying in the market, in this case Google and um, counterparts, trying to solve a basic gridlock problem, trying to create a new resource that is a unified a database of all these work. Of course, solving has got the gridlock problem too, that people can hold it up and fight against it and try to get a bigger share, and it's, it's fascinating. Uh, yes, I know, but one of the solutions to gridlock in this context is a class action mechanism that is the structure within which this lawsuit is taking place. Class action is one of the mechanisms that we have in the American legal system for aggregating uh, a series of claims, no one of which is worth pursuing, but collectively uh, uh, generates a lot of economic value. Well, let's. We, we're almost out of time. I want to close with uh, two issues. Uh, one is the example of airspace, which I found fascinating. Talk about how that evolved. Um, never thought about it before. Flying over your house, uh, could you stop an airplane and require uh, payment for trespassing or stopping? Right, so what, what I teach my you know my first year students, uh, my, my law students, and, and and sort of people's intuition is that when you own a piece of land. Uh, you own uh, uh, up to the heavens and down to the center of the earth. You own a a column of a column of ownership uh, that extends all the way up and all the way down. Um, and it makes sense for you know ten feet up, twenty feet up, fifty feet up. But how about a thousand feet up? Um, and when airplanes were first invented in the um, early part of twentieth century, you know no one had ever thought about this before because it hadn't ever been an issue. We just assumed that your column of ownership went all the way up. So if you wanted to overfly. Uh, from uh, from New York uh, to D.C., you would fly. You would uh, necessarily fly over uh, the separate ownerships of thousands of people, each one of whom potentially would have uh, a trespass claim against you. Uh, so one way to solve so people, lawyers and policymakers struggled in the early part of the 20th century to figure out how to make it possible to fly, not technologically but legally. How would you make it possible to have corridors of space um, over which you could fly? And part of the solution to that was to say that you, you, know, you own up to the heavens, um, but as a matter of law, heavens is 1,000 feet up. And you know, 1,000 feet up, you're in, you're in heaven, and uh, you, uh, you don't have rights, and uh, below 1,000 feet, the landowner uh, has, has, uh, has some level of rights. So uh, we solved the gridlock problem, we made it possible to fly by a timely redefinition of how far up in the sky heaven started. So my, my, other, my closing question is... is only tangentially related because it's about airports. So uh, you talk in the book about how hard it is to build an airport, and I think there's all kinds of issues there. But one way that we solve these kind of gridlock problems in, in terms of public policy is eminent domain. Right? Eminent domain is invoked as a way of avoiding the holdup problem, avoiding the costs of each landowner when you're trying to assemble a large bundle of, of individual uh, private property rights. Now, it's important to mention, I think, that that there are a lot of private solutions to these kind of problems that, that happen and that work. You don't make a big announcement that you want to buy up a bunch of land. You're going to do it quietly. And, of course, there have been many successful examples of this to avoid the holdup problem. But I'm curious whether you think that eminent domain is a useful way. And, of course, 
it could be invoked in intellectual property as a way to solve the the Martin Luther King documentary story. You could have said the government could pass a law that says this documentary that showed on TV with all of its uh, citations and visual citations of, of various pieces of, of physical property, uh, the owner is entitled to all of them. Any the the documentary maker is entitled to them. We're going to just bundle them all together because it's a socially desirable project in the same way that we do it for an airport or I think not in the case of, a, say, a shopping mall. So I think it gets abused. So one, I'm curious, do you think that eminent domain is going to possibly be a way to go in the intellectual property? And two, in the case of physical property such as land and solving the holdup problem, do you think it's been abused and uh, there's public choice problems? Well, absolutely. I, 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 people hate having their homes condemned. So sure, you can always solve the problem of too many owners by eliminating private ownership. But that, uh, to me, is really a last best solution in almost every case. I, uh, and in the, in the book I write about this, and we could do a whole separate show just on, um, on the problem of eminent domain and people's reactions to Suzette Kilo, who had her house taken, uh, so, 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 um, taken in a way that people viewed as, uh, you know, not really appropriate. So yeah, you, you can solve the problem of too many property rights by eliminating property rights. I don't think that's a good approach. In, in the intellectual property area, uh, in, in the drug development, there already exists something called a march in, march in right. The government um, already has the right to march in and take patents. Um, but pharmaceutical companies have argued, I think rightly, that if that right were ever exercised, it would really crush the incentive for them to invest in, to spend the billion dollars it takes on average to create um, a new, to get a drug through the FDA approval process. So the answer, I don't think, in general, uh, to the problem of too many rights is to eliminate them. I think the 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 first and most important uh, uh, step is to notice that there is a problem. To notice that fragmentation can be extremely costly, whether it's in drug development, in uh, telecom, in uh, developing new airports, in uh, cutting edge of art, is to just notice that all of these different problems across the cutting edge of the economy are the same problem. And then to once you've done that, to think about tools for uh, making it easier for entrepreneurs in the market to assemble rights where it's cost-effective to do so. So ASCAP is an example of that in the copyright context for radio play. Uh, we have what's called patent pools. The reason that you're, you can pop a DVD disc into any um, DVD player is that the several hundred patents that are required to make that work um, are all pooled together, and you pay one licensing fee to the entire pool uh, when, you, when you buy a DVD maker. So there are a number of uh, private market-based solutions to assembling the problem of fragmented rights. But you have to first see that there's a problem, and then you have to think creatively, well, okay, what kinds of market institutions uh, might, uh, might the law be able to facilitate? Eminent domain is sort of the nuclear option. It's, um, it is a big deterrent, uh, but it's not one you want to ever have to use. My guest today has been Michael Heller. Michael, thanks for being part of EconTalk. It's been great talking with you all. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.